Uh, dear friends, the Bible says in the book of Nahum, in Nahum chapter 1, it says in verse 2, it says, A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on His adversaries, and He reserves wrath for His enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm is His way, and clouds are the dust beneath His feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The blossoms of Lebanon wither. Mountains quake because of Him. And the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by His presence. The world and all the inhabitants in it. Who can stand before His indignation? Who can endure the burning of His anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. And the rocks are broken up by Him. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And He knows those who take refuge in Him. And attendance of the Kentucky Derby. Uh, this is the God that we seek to make known to you this afternoon, this day, this whole weekend. Is the God of Nahum, the God of the Spirit of the Prophets, the God of glory. And this God, whom we seek to make known, is a God that can only be known exclusively. And that is through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, we're not out here to proclaim a generic deity, but we're here to proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the true God. We know that Jesus, in the book of John, made seven I Am statements. A couple of them are, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the bread of life, etc. And Jesus did that to stress His exclusivity and to reveal the reality, the truth, that He is the one true God. That there is no other God but Jesus Christ. And He Himself is the light of the world, the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness does not comprehend it. And we come here this evening as, as it were, a city set on a hill, shining the light of the gospel in this dark place, in this dark world. My friends, there is little hope in the world. There is no hope for the wicked. There is no peace in the world apart from the Prince of Peace, whose kingdom is not even of this world, whose kingdom is otherworldly. It is alien. It is outside of this realm. And it is a kingdom which is being built by Him. And it is being expanded by Him for His glory. And He is the King of it. Jesus Christ is the King. And so we come as ambassadors of the King with a message. A message which does not originate within ourselves or by ourselves but a message that has authority because of the one who gave it unto us, who in himself possesses all authority. What did he say in Matthew 28? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And so he himself has said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. 2,000 years ago, that was what was proclaimed, and here we are, centuries later, and we still say, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. My friends, we plead with you to embrace Christ, to embrace the King of glory. For He has promised to be gracious to those who come to Him. He says, for the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Yes, sir. I'm preaching the truth of Jesus Christ. Are you a believer? Are you born again? Yes. How long I don't think so. I don't think you could do that. But do you walk like Jesus walked? Because that's what the book of 1 John says. Is it, if we know, we know we're of Him if we walk like He walked. It's not that you proclaim it with your mouth. It's that you live it with your life. That you've been changed.
Uh, dear friends, we come out here bringing the message of peace. Uh, Jesus is the King of the Kingdom of God, and He's the Prince of Peace. The King and the Prince. The Lord of Glory. And the Gospel brings peace, my friends. It brings peace between the sinner and God, and even the sinner and other sinners. Because when someone is saved by God's grace, they no longer hate their fellow man. Many of you are filled with hatred toward us, as well as towards your other, uh, uh, your fellow men. Perhaps even some of your friends you get angry at. You get, you get filled with hatred towards in your heart oftentimes. But my friends, the gospel of grace enables us to show grace toward those who are around us. Because we've been put into a right standing before God. See, we're not born in a right standing with God. We're born in sin. We're born in a wrong standing with God. And it's interesting, a lot of preachers say, you need a relationship with Jesus. My friends, you already have a relationship with Jesus. That's not the problem. The problem is, what kind of relationship do you have? See, the, the, the wayward lawbreaker, the murderer, the, 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 the thief has a relation to a judge, but it's one of enmity. It's one of contempt. My friends, you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. The question is, what kind is it? Is it one of enmity and war? Are you at war with God and God with you? Or are you at peace? Are you at peace with the Lord Jesus Christ, your Creator? We know the book of Colossians tells us all things were made by Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ. My friends, see, Jesus Christ died for the ungodly. Paul says, at the right time, Jesus Christ died for the ungodly. See, we deserve death for our sins against God. We deserve to go to hell. Which is death in the fullest sense, the second death. We deserve to go there because we've offended the Holy One. We've offended the infinite Holy God of glory. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. The God who struck down Uzzah, when he touched the Ark of the Covenant, as my brother mentioned earlier, he touched the Ark of the Covenant and God struck him down. Why? Because he's holy. Because he's holy. What do the angels of God in heaven say constantly? Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 6, they say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And so we stand in relation to this God condemned. We stand before God as condemned in His sight and deserving of hell. That's why Jesus Christ came to give Himself up as a ransom to die upon the cross and to propitiate. That word means to satisfy, to make appeasement. He propitiated the wrath of God. Jesus Christ through His death satisfied God's wrath and God's justice. We know all the way back in Genesis that God promised that Jesus would come. Right after Adam and Eve fell in the garden, God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. You will bruise him on the heel, but he will crush your head. Jesus Christ came to undo the work of the devil. Satan came and deceived the woman in the garden. And she, in turn, brought her husband down with her, the head of the human race, Adam. And therefore, all man in Adam, all mankind sinned in Adam. And so, my friends, we need that to be undone. We need Jesus to reverse the effects of the fall. And He does that through His atonement. He does that through His death upon the cross of Calvary. And Paul highlights this in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 5. He says in verse 18, So then as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, that's speaking of Adam, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted in justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. Through Jesus Christ's obedience, through Jesus Christ's labor and toil, 
We can be made right with God, my friends. I've been reconciled to God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because He not only died but rose again on the third day. And the question for you is, have you been reconciled to God? Have you been born a second time? Have you been born of the Holy Spirit? Has God done a work in your life? Has God saved you from your sin? Can you say, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. See, we don't recognize the character of God, who God is. God is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in His being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. And what are we called to do? We're called to love and to serve Him. And we can only do that through having been made right with Him through His Son. Reconciliation, friends. We need it. We need it desperately. See, we don't need our social difficulties to be removed from us or our, our financial ailments to be taken away or our health afflictions to be lightened. We need our sin to be dealt with. We need the result of sin to be removed and the power of sin in this life to be taken away. That's what we need. That's what we really need. We don't need therapy. We need salvation. And Jesus, what did He say He came to do? In Luke 19.10, Jesus said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came to save those who are lost, who are blind, who are miserable and wretched and poor. My friends, hell is a real place. And we don't want you to go there. We want you to go to heaven. We want you to go to heaven when you die, not hell. We don't wish hell upon our greatest enemy. In fact, our Lord Christ said to pray for our enemies. Pray for those who persecute us. We want you, even those who revile us and hate us, to be saved so that you can enter heaven. So that you're saved from the power of sin in your life. Think about the slavery, the sin in which you live, my friends. You must continually go back to your pornography and continue to go back to your drunkenness and continue to go back to your worship of sport. Your worship of sports. And there's nothing wrong with sports. I enjoy watching sports. But God is jealous for our worship and we are not to worship anything else but the true God. But if you're outside of Christ, you're a slave to these things. You're a slave to sin. Engaging in your pride and your selfishness. Your self-love. See, Jesus came not as a self-help guru. Jesus came as a self-hate guru. Jesus came to call us to hate ourselves. What did Jesus say in Luke 19? Oh, excuse me, in Luke 9. He said, if any man is to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and come after me. That doesn't sound like self-improvement. That doesn't sound like self-fulfillment. My friends, we're called to forget ourselves because we're not, we're not the center of the universe. It's not about us. It's about Christ. It's about Christ's glory. It's about Jesus. We're made to live unto Him, not for ourselves. And so we call you, my friends. I call you, my dear friends, to repent and to turn to Jesus Christ in faith, resting in Him alone, and God promises to forgive you of your sins and to wrap you in the righteousness of His Son. And then you will be able to fulfill that which the end to which mankind has been created, and that's to live to God's glory. Are you living to God's glory, sir? Yes, I'm Have you been born of the Spirit? Jesus said, if a man is not born again, he can't see God's kingdom. He's blind, spiritually. When we look at Jesus' ministry, we see he goes around saving people from all these physical ailments. One of them of which was blindness. And Jesus showed such power. My friends, Jesus is still in the business of doing that today. 
Only he does it spiritually. He removes spiritual blindness. God bless you, sir. That's what we need. We need our spiritual blindness to be removed. That's what you need, my friends. You need your eyes to be open to see the beauty of Christ. If Jesus is simply a, an accessory, uh, just a, a side issue to you, and He's just something that is peripheral in your life, then you do not believe in the Jesus of the Bible. It's a, a self-made Jesus, an idol, an idol. You're committing idolatry. In fact, many people who confess to know Jesus Christ, who profess to be followers of Christ, believe in a social justice warrior, feminized Jesus. They believe in a weak Jesus. My friends, the Jesus of the Bible said things that were offensive and made people angry. Certainly he was compassionate. He was filled with compassion. But my friends, he was also bold. And he said the truth, even if those who were listening were going to be offended and further hardened by it. And friends, we must tell you the truth, even if it angers you, because we care for you. See, my friends, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Jesus Christ on the cross was treated as a sinner and was damned, was crushed under the wrath of God so that sinners could in turn be treated as righteous in God's sight. So that we could be in a right standing before the creator of the universe. See, God's eyes see what is committed in darkness. My friends, God sees the sexual acts which are done in darkness and done in secret and private. God sees the lies that have been spoken, that have flowed from your very lips. God sees the thoughts. God sees your thought life, my friends. Jesus said in Matthew 5, if you look at a woman with lust, you commit adultery in your heart. God sees you as an adulterer. He then goes on to say, if you have anger in your heart towards your brother, that you're a murderer. See, God's standard is so high. Our standards are so low. And we think that we're all right. We think someone like Hitler or one of the mass shooters, you know, in recent U.S. history, those people are bad. Those people deserve hell. But not us. Not me. My friends, I'll be the first to say I deserve hell. I deserve hell to the uttermost. But God has shown mercy toward me in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God has shown grace. And it's not to the neglect of His holiness. God has shown grace and has still upheld His justice. How did He do it? The cross of Jesus Christ. The cross of Jesus Christ. So friends, these sins of which I spoke earlier, these sins that you and I have committed are like stains upon our consciences. Our consciences testify to the reality of our sin. They remind us, our consciences remind us of our sin. They're speaking to us, as it were, daily of our deserving damnation and of our sin against the Holy One. The only way that your troubled conscience can be relieved is through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the blood of the New Covenant. See, my friends, Paul says in Ephesians 1, I'll read it directly out of Ephesians 1. Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in, he in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. See, before God made the world, He had predestined that He would save a people to Himself. And they are called the elect. And God the Father chose them unto Himself. And He entered into a compact, entered into a covenant relationship with the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And he gave him this charge that if he was to die for the sins of this elect group, that the Father would reward him with a kingdom and a throne and would give this people unto him as his bride. And Christ agreed to do so. That's called the covenant of redemption. And when the right time came, Jesus came into time itself and laid aside His privileges and became a man and died upon the cross. Satan would eat your asshole. Sir, you need to be born again. Have you been born again? Yes, I got born again and then he told me that Satan's going to eat my asshole. Well, sir, if you speak those kind of things, I don't think you're born again because Scripture talks about if someone is saved, that what comes out of their mouth will be edifying, not sinful. I'm not dishonoring sorry, God. I'm not, I'm In fact, I know that you're not on the phone. I see. I know you're on Snapchat. <laughs> I'm not an idiot. I have Snapchat too. And my friends, God is not mocked. God is not mocked. What does the Bible say in Galatians? Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. And though you may feel young, though you may feel as if death is never going to come upon you, it will one day if the Lord tarries in His return. But friends, I want to say, Jesus entered into time and through the shedding of His own blood, He enacted the covenant of grace, the new covenant. And that covenant of grace is exclusive, as I mentioned earlier. So if you want to take part in that covenant, my friends, what you must do is embrace Christ. Embrace the Lord Jesus Christ in saving faith. And faith, what is faith? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. It is taking God at His Word, saying, God, I believe that Christ died for my sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day. And if you do that, God will wash your sins away. They will be forgotten. And the righteousness of Christ will be imputed to you, and you will be adopted into the family of God. And, entered in, and you will enter into heavenly glory. And you will take part in that new covenant, in that covenant of grace. But friends, if you reject the Lord Jesus Christ, if you reject the gracious offer of salvation, all that awaits is a fearful expectation of the wrath of God that will consume the adversaries. Do you have a part in this new covenant? Do you have part with Christ? Or would you rather part with Christ that you might be with your sin? Are you united to Jesus Christ? Are you united to Christ by faith? That's what you must be, dear friends. In union with Christ. In union with Christ is the most glorious thing. It's the most glorious state to be in in this life. See, sin promises joy. It promises pleasure. But it never delivers. Maybe for a brief moment. But never long term. It always leaves the soul empty. But serving God brings joy. And Scripture says the joy of the Lord is your strength. See, what people are searching after joy. I'll be done in a couple seconds. I'll bring it to a close. The joy of the Lord. My friends, we plead with you to enter in to the joy of Christ. The joy of our Master, both yours and mine, because Christ is your Lord. Christ is your Master. You don't make Him Lord. You don't make Him Master. He is Lord. What we must do is recognize that Lordship and submit to it. Submit to it because it is reality. That is what is actually real. In fact, if you deny God's existence, if you reject Christ, you're in a delusion. You're not living reality. Reality is Christ is Lord and He demands obedience. He demands it. He's not just sitting off to the side, oh, pleading with sinners, come. He calls His people and by His Spirit, He regenerates them, gives them the gift of faith and they come running to Him. Because He Himself said, My sheep hear My voice and they follow Me.
And he said, I am the good shepherd and no one will snatch these sheep out of my hand. He says, my father who has given them to me is greater than I. No one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. And then he said this, I and my father are one. So to the one true triune God be glory. The praise and honor. See, we need to give God glory, friends. Worship God with me today. Worship God with us today, my friends. He's worthy. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For His loving kindness is everlasting. That's Psalm 106.1. So to the triune God be glory. Forever and ever. Amen.